I'm Linda Hirsch, and this is EdCast, a program created and produced by educators for everyone interested in education. How many of us have said we want to make a difference in the world? Often we don't know where to start, or even if it's possible. But it can take just one person to let us know that we have placed them on a path that they would never have taken. My guest today is Nadia Lopez, founder of the Mott Hall Bridges Academy in Brooklyn. She is someone who has made a difference. Today we speak with her about her school, her students, and what educators must do to help students achieve success. It's the story of a principal and a student, and a fundraising effort that's taking a middle school from Brownsville to the White House and to Harvard. In Brownsville they expect you to fail, they expect you to stay in where you're at, they expect you to not be anything in life. You wouldn't think that something from Brownsville would get so big and catch people's attention. I was walking home from a store on Martin Luther King Day, and Brandon approaches me and he says, he's with the Humans of New York page on Facebook. He took some pictures and he asked me, who inspired you the most? And I answered my principal, Ms. Lopez. She would tell us how, if you want to be anything in life, we have to work towards who we want to be, not what the society wants us to be. Joining me today is Nadia Lopez, principal and founder of the Mott Hall Bridges Academy, a middle school in Brooklyn. She is the author of the upcoming book, The Bridge to Brilliance, a BET Black Girls Rock Change Agent winner, a global teacher finalist, and a TED Talk speaker. Through her many initiatives and mentoring projects, she has provided opportunity and inspiration to thousands of Brooklyn's young people. Thank you for joining us today on EdCast. Thank you for having me. Sure. We started with a brief clip of your student, Vidal Chasne, in which he says that you are the person who influenced him the most. Can you tell us a little bit about the project, how this all came to be, and what happened as a result of it? So there was a gentleman by the name of Brandon Stanton, who is the founder of Humans of New York. Um, Brandon happened to randomly come to Brownsville and encounters my scholar Vidal. Um, when they first had a conversation, the question was about, you know, what is life like in Brownsville? And he spoke about witnessing a man being thrown off of a roof. And out of that, he asked him, well, how do you survive? What, who's your greatest influence in a community like this? Um, and as a result, he named me as his greatest influence. Um, I didn't imagine that he would ever say that about me, but I take great interest and pride in really in being there for my scholars. Um, what happened as a result of this? So as a result of it, Brandon actually came to the school because a million people liked the post within 24 hours wow. and wanted to know who Miss Lopez was. Um, he found me on Facebook, ironically, and told me that he would be coming back to Brownsville. And I told him, you know, I could give him a couple of minutes of my time, but he would, um, he, if he wanted to, he could stay and meet with me and my team because they, everyone was going through just a challenging time. Mm -hmm. um, after several days of just visiting the school, he realized that it was a community that really wanted to ensure that children were valued and that despite how much poverty surrounded us, um, we wanted our children to have a world-class education. Um, so he said, what would you want to do if you had an opportunity? And I said, the one thing I would love for them to do is actually visit colleges outside of their educators and doctors that they visit mm -hmm. on a yearly basis. They really don't often have mm -hmm. an opportunity of meeting someone. So. He said, OK, what does that look like? And I said, well, you know, if we wanted to do an overnight trip, it probably would be about $100,000, well, $30,000. And he said, where would you like to go? So initially, we thought about perhaps going to DC. Um, but after sitting it with um, Brandon, myself, and my director of programs, Monica Chu, I said to them, you know, when I was a child, no one ever told me that I could go to Harvard. But they also never told me I couldn't go to Harvard. And somewhere along the lines, I limited myself. Mm -hmm. It wasn't until I was in my 30s and I was attending New Leaders mm -hmm. um, 
I had visited Harvard and realized that the only person who had set limitations was myself. So I want them to be able to have that experience, to go to the places mm -hmm. that they thought they could never go. And he said, okay. And he decided he wanted to do a fundraiser for the school. And it was honestly supposed to be $100,000. Um, and that morphed into us actually receiving $1.4 million over a period of 14 days. That's amazing. And we're going to talk in a little bit later about what you've done with that money. I want to read for you, as you already know, exactly why Vidal said you were the person that influenced him the most. Okay. He said, when we get in trouble, she doesn't suspend us. She calls us to her office and explains to us how society was built down around us. And she tells us that each time somebody fails out of school, a new jail cell gets built. And one time she made every student stand up, one at a time, and she told each one of us that we matter. Why do you think that this is the important message to give to students? You know, I think that, especially in the community that I serve, they're constantly reminded that their lives have no value. Um, it was during a time, especially with after um, Trayvon Martin being killed, mm -hmm. um, Eric Gardner, it, it was just the weight of it all, of children feeling like they weren't valuable, especially young men. And there is a school to prison pipeline that we just have to mm -hmm. face and understand the dynamics of how that plays out in poor communities. And so I constantly try to remind my scholars that, you know, there is a society that's built primarily for those who are living off of those mm -hmm. who are incarcerated, mm -hmm. right? And 80% of the residents, 80% of the population in our New York State prisons come from communities like Brownsville. Mm -hmm. So the more that they misbehave, the more that they're not focused on their education, it creates that mm -hmm. pipeline for them to end up being right. in prison. Um, and they have to know that they matter. They have to know that they're valued. And if they're not reminded, then they'll make the wrong decisions. Now, who influenced you, and what made you decide to become an educator? For me, it started at home. It was my mother um, and my father, but I would say more so my mother because she was the go-getter. She was the one who would find the best schools for me. Um, my parents are not from this country. My mother's from Guatemala, and my father's from Honduras. My mother. Um, had barely an elementary school education and my dad probably finished middle school mm -hmm. going into high school. So they could not teach me what I would learn in the American system, but they could find the best schools that would be the spaces that would allow me to thrive. Um, and then the educators that my, that my parents p placed me in front of, right, because they made a consorted effort to get me into those schools, I was able to find really dynamic educators who truly believe that every child could mm -hmm. succeed. So throughout my life, I've, I've just been blessed. Um, and then when I decided to open up a school, um, I had a phenomenal educator, Dr. Evelyn Castro, who sat on um, my team when I wrote my proposal. Mm -hmm. um, she's actually teaching at Mega Evers as well. But you know, I think that throughout my life, I've just had phenomenal individuals who didn't let me think that I was less than anything valuable. So you personally know the power of having a person who believes in you yes. from your own personal experience. Tell us a little bit about Mott Hole Bridges Academy. Where is it located? When was it founded? How many students? What's your population like? So Mott Hole Bridges Academy was created in 2010. I wrote the proposal. Um, and at the time, Mayor Bloomberg, um, had decided that he wanted to create small schools that were mm -hmm. themed. So we are a STEAM focused school, science, technology, engineering, arts, and math. Mm -hmm. um, it is located in the Brownsville section of Brooklyn. At this time, we have about 210 scholars who attend the school. Mm -hmm. It's about 50-50. Um, they come from the local surrounding schools as well. Um, a large majority of our scholars are considered poor. We have probably now 90% who are free or reduced lunch, 98% mm -hmm. um, African American. Um, and, but it's a, it's a space that's resilient. Mm -hmm. Brownsville is a place that they've been told that they're less than, but they're more than. They're always in survival mode. My um, husband was born and raised in Brownsville. Was he? Yes, he was. Well, I mean, <laughs> Brownsville used to be known as, yeah. you know, the Park Avenue of well, Brooklyn. I don't think it was the Park <laughs> Avenue when he was raised there. But, um, um, but in these times, um, you know, there's, it, there's a sense of resilience. Right. And 
they're fighters, but you have to teach them what to fight for and what to advocate for. And so through this process of just being an educator, I, when I got into the space, I couldn't understand why you have a community that's so broken and why people weren't there to save them. And it's not a savior um, where um, you think that you're going to be the Florence Nightingale mm -hmm. of children, um, but it's about saving them in terms of reminding them that they are children of mm -hmm. greatness. And so our colors are black and purple, which I'm happy yes, to be I wearing today, right, yes. um, because I want them to be reminded that they do come from a lineage of um, astrologers, scientists, engineers who have done dynamic things. Mm -hmm. And through education, they can still be great. Now, when they came to you from the surrounding schools, you know, we've on this show, we've discussed the academic mm -hmm. achievement gap in great mm -hmm. detail. We've had many people on to come and discuss it. When they come to you from the surrounding elementary schools, what are their proficiency levels in terms of English and math? Um, and what has your success been in those areas with them right now? So they come for um, their proficiency level usually ranges from low ones to mm -hmm. twos. Mm -hmm. um, Three and fours are considered on grade level mm -hmm. above. I would say at this time we have 93% of our scholars who are not proficient. Mm -hmm. um, and it's unfortunate because one, it starts at home, but oftentimes you have children who don't have libraries in their mm -hmm. homes, right? So Mostly, I would imagine. Right, and mm -hmm. so that, that becomes a really great issue because if you have parents who, I've had parents who are illiterate, who aren't even able to read forms, they can't teach their mm -hmm. children. Um, they start school at a, at a late age, maybe at six years old. You have teachers who are often not prepared to deal with the dynamics and the needs of this type of community. The libraries are embedded within the housing developments and oftentimes what happens is, is that there's a lot of gangs. So we are mm -hmm. now up to 34 gangs within oh. that small community. Wow. <laughs> and it makes it difficult to actually go mm -hmm. to the library. So what does your curriculum do to try to compensate for some of these things? Well, we, we still maintain a rigorous curriculum, mm -hmm. but we have to make sure that the text is accessible. Mm -hmm. um, I have a dynamic team that works together. Mm -hmm. um, so we have the scholars read articles that are from the New York Times, mm -hmm. but we take time in, mm -hmm. in terms of breaking it mm -hmm. down. Mm -hmm. um, we make math fun. We, we have them do real life experiences, um, real world activities and applications. Mm -hmm. um, but in addition to that, we just offer a number of programs that's an extension to what they do mm -hmm. in a class. So we have lab rats mm -hmm. where our scholars actually dissect animals. So that would be starfish, mm -hmm. dogs, mm -hmm. um, fetal pigs. Um, we have our own bee harvesting program where our scholars make their own honey. We have a community garden where they learn how to create their own products, things like that so that they're able to understand the implications of how they can. So it's a kind of experiential base yeah. and, it, uh, and it works with what they come with and tries to make things more accessible. Yes. One of the things, of course, you did with your funding was mm -hmm. you took your scholars to Harvard. So we let's did. take a look and see what happened at Harvard. Okay. If you love creating, discovering, exploring, building, you are going to love college. When you want it, you will work hard for it. This is your right. Because you deserve to be in this space, and you are now opening up the door, creating a legacy for those who will come behind you. I want to be an OBGYN. I want to major in culinary arts and minor in um, business. Architecture and design and have my own architecture engineering firm. If you go to college, you're going to have a good degree and you got to have good jobs. I'm going to stay in school, graduate eighth grade, graduate high school, and go to college. Education makes a difference. And education allows you to pursue something that you're really passionate about. So it's important that you guys are thinking about your futures. It's important that you guys take trips like this. You don't let anybody tap it. College is meant to uncount. I think it's almost deja vu. I, I, I think I wanted them to be able to see that it was possible for them to walk on this ground and not shying away and feeling as though they didn't belong. Coming here does make me want to come to college because it gives you the opportunities to do stuff that lets you set out your comfort zone. And I'm going to make it happen by studying really hard and listening to my parents. 
aunt, she thought it was just like cramming, just straight cramming, studying, everything, just studying. And I saw it's like a lot of fun. It's like a lot of things you can do here. So I think I really want to go to college now, like more than I did before. I just feel proud that all this came from people that care about how you turn out to be. What did your students take away from this visit? How did it affect them? They took away the possibilities. Um, they've been told so long what they can't do, and I've always told them what they can do. And a lot of them, when they went into the classrooms, um, they had specially designed classes for them and professors from Harvard were teaching them. Oh, wow. And they had been exposed to a lot of it. So like 15th century um, Chinese art, they had been exposed to that and could engage in a conversation about what that experience was like learning in an art class. Um, and their parents, to see their parents have them arrive at 4.45 in the morning, um, it was a sense of pride and it uplifted a community. That's great. Did you visit any other schools or are you visiting any other schools as well? Yes. So um, we recently had a trip to no, Yale. We're not going to get into Harvard. <laughs> I mean, not... um, we recently had a trip to Yale. Our scholars mm -hmm. um, who ha are part of a mentoring program engaged mm -hmm. in a hackathon there. Okay. Um, Morgan State was our recent trip with our okay. eighth graders. We'll be taking trips throughout um, New York City to all of the CUNY um, schools in the next three weeks. Um, and they'll, my alumni association that we just started will be going to Wagner College, which is my alma mater. Good feet, terrific. Yes. Now, you are a clear example of the notion that principles matter. Mm -hmm. As a principal on this program, what do you think principals can and should do to improve their schools and their outcomes for students? So first and foremost, I, I think that you have to always lead by example. Okay. Um, but I'm a career changer, which I think gave me a different way of seeing and having a perspective of what education should look like. I think that it's important to network. Mm -hmm. I think that it's very important that you can be committed to your school, but know what's out there. Because the only way that we can truly prepare children to have um, a global education and really be able to prepare, be prepared for 21st century careers is by actually speaking mm -hmm. to those who are doing those same things. So. Um, I try my best to always be in various spaces. I don't stay closed-minded to just being an educator, but learning from people of different backgrounds, cultures, um, and learning to be very tolerant. Mm -hmm. And not only just thinking about being the leader, but also still being the learner. Um, so I learn a lot from my staff and my scholars and the community I serve, and it's hard. Mm -hmm. um, I'm a mother, and you feel like you're sacrificing a lot, but that's part of the work. And what about the role of the teacher? You know, we've um, discussed the effects of poverty on education on this program. We've looked at the latest research. And many people are saying that the teacher, the school, really can't trump poverty, that it's, it's, such, an it's such a huge obstacle. What's your take on what teachers and schools can do to help students overcome these challenges? My response to that is poverty didn't start today. OK. Right, I, <clears throat> I came from a poor neighborhood. I grew up in Crown Heights and went to school in Fort Greene and bed died during the crack era. So that's not an excuse. It's you want to have to do this work. You want to, you would have to want to wake up every single morning and give your all. And you have to fundamentally understand the community that you're serving. How do you keep your teachers going? I mean, you know, the, this is a hard job. It is. I'm always telling people teaching, it is. but we're all so easy. You know, why isn't everybody running to do it? How do you keep them motivated. So it, just like with the scholars, you have to praise them. But I still stay in the classrooms. I teach you as do. well. Yes. Um, I lead by example. I model for the teachers. Um, I know their curriculum. I sit down with them. I plan with them. I'm not far removed from the very thing that I love, which is mm -hmm. education. And so that's why I have a different dynamic mm -hmm. when it comes to my staff, because they can't tell me what can't be done, because can I'll be show done. them what will be done. You have some other mentoring initiatives we, that we have, maybe a little time. Tell us about some of the key ones that you think have also been important. Um, so our I Matter has been really, I really matter, yep. yes, and what instrumental. Is so it focuses on empowering our young men through a platform in which they 
get to have engage in dialogue with men of the community. Um, we bring together at least 250 to 300 young men from throughout the community of Brownsville to have various conversations five times a year. We have She Is Me, which is an empowerment summit for our young mm -hmm. women, as well as the women of the community. <clears throat> um, we've done initiatives like Be Cool, Be Kind, which is pro-kindness as opposed to just focusing on <clears throat> bullying. Um, as you know, with the college initiative, taking them to various colleges right. throughout New York City. Um, Would you like to start your own elementary school? <laughs> In other words, <laughs> is there an elementary school that exists that embodies some of the principles that you've been pushing at Mott Hall Bridges Academy that you know of? I'm sure there are. Is One is not coming to <laughs> mind immediately, all right. No, I, I can't say that it doesn't come to mind. Um, I think that there are a number of educators, principals, who are working just as hard. Would and you want a Mott Hall Bridges Elementary School that fed into Mott Hall Bridges Academy I would Academy definitely school? love um, an elementary you're not busy school. Enough, so I'm giving um, you something else. <laughs> right. I'm not, I, I'll say this. You know, I would love to have a school that would feed into our middle school that has the same principles, not principal. L-E, <laughs> um, -E, not right. A-L. Okay. Um, and if I had to think about extending the school, I would have it become a high school. Um, but I also would need the space, and we don't have the space for that. So my dream is to one day have my okay. own building. Your scholars also went to the White House. I know that Vidal went. So let's take yes. a look a little bit at that visit with President Barack Obama. Sure. We are leaving tonight. We are driving to Washington, D.C. We are going to the White House and we are going to meet with President Obama. <laughs> Go get it, right? Hi. How are you doing? Good to see you. Good to see you, man. Thanks, President. We look sharp, man. Right. Your life's not a straight line. You don't do things alone. No, you never do. Nobody does things alone. Everybody always needs support, and a lot of people like to help. So you'll have a lot of people supporting you out there. You just have to make sure that you seize those opportunities. So the president makes it a key point that we are not alone, that we don't do things alone, we need the support of others. What would you like other people to take away from your experience? What, what can we extrapolate from the Mott Hole Bridges Academy story? Um, I think the most important element of the story is that we have to work together as a village and create the change we want to see. Um, the work is extremely hard, but if people are willing to give just like they gave to the $1.4 million, the human capital is just as valuable as the dollar that comes in. Um, our children need to see themselves and others, and they need to know that there's a community that wants them to win. So I believe everybody can be a champion. Now you're game. launching a website. Tell us about that website. What can we find on that website? What's it called? Yes, so the website <clears throat> is The Lopez Effect. Uh -huh. um, it, <laughs> I coined it because I just believe in all the things that I do um, creates a pathway for greatness for our children. So whether it's the partnerships, whether it's um, the opportunity to be on a TED Talk, whether it's to be in a Global Prize, for people to see that education is not just confined to one building, mm -hmm. um, we have so much to give to the world. So you can find links for various um, sites that I'm associated with, a lot of the videos that you've played today, um, and then the things that are coming up next, and what, as well as the book. What's coming up next? What are some things that you're planning? So the book is coming out officially um, August 30th, but mm -hmm. it could be pre-ordered through it, Amazon. The Bridge to Brilliance. Yes, okay. The Bridge to Brilliance. Mm -hmm. um, the TED Talk will be released September 12th, so right for perfect for school time, um, and as well as a host of other things, kind of some surprises that will be coming up. Are there things that you're doing in your school right now in terms of you know, pushing the students academic? I know you refer to them as scholars. Yes. And I've heard that term used by some other charter schools as mm -hmm. well. Why do you feel that it is so important to refer to them as scholars? To me, it's important because they need to know that they're lifelong learners. It doesn't matter if it's charter or district school. Our children need to know that learning never stops. I'm still a learner. Um, and if we start to instill that in them from a very young age, then they'll appreciate and value education. And they don't see it as an eight to three job. They see it as something that they do for the rest of their lives. Now, you started your school in 2010. So yes. you've had um, some graduating classes. Yes. or. Uh, classes already. Where have they been going when they leave Mott Bridges? So when um, we've had three graduating classes, they go to schools like Mega Everest Prep, Bronx, I mean not Bronx, um, BCA which is Brooklyn College Academy, 
They've gone to Benjamin Banneker as well as some of the performing arts schools throughout New York City. Um, we're very strategic about where they go because we want to make sure that whatever we've instilled in them in middle school will continue on when they get to high school. And have they been graduating high school or are they doing well in high school from what you see? So from what I see, they are doing well. We haven't had our first graduating class. My very first graduating class is now in the 11th grade. So that's why I started the Alumni Association so that this way that they have a space that they can come back to and we've continue on with them going to colleges mm -hmm. and getting the support that they need. With only probably less than a minute left, if we all wanted to try and emulate the Lopez effect <laughs> and couldn't do everything, what do you think teachers and principals should try to do right now? Love what you do. I, I can't express that anymore. Um, or any other sentiments. You have to love this. This is a calling. It's not a job that you just think you're going to show up. The money is just, it's never enough. Um, you know, there's times that you feel like you're sacrificing, but you have to understand it's not for your own personal sake. It's for the good of our, our universe. Um, and we've learned that, right? We're all humans, but we have to have purpose. And so if you're a teacher or educator, just love and be passionate about education. Thank you so much for joining us today. Nadia Lopez, the principal and founder of the Mott Hole Bridges Academy. Your story is an inspiring one for all of us, and I really hope that we can continue to, to use you as an example. So thank you so much. Thank you so much. Don't go away. We'll be right back with our Ed Bites. <music> Welcome back to this edition of Ed Bites. In many classrooms today, Students bring laptops and take notes on their computers. Pen and paper seem almost quaint. Yet NPR reports that students actually retain more when taking notes by hand. While students may take more verbatim notes on a laptop, they actually performed worse than their peers who wrote their notes when asked some follow-up questions about the material covered. Closing low-performing schools is controversial. Some studies found little improvement for students forced to transfer out of a failing school. But according to new studies by the Thomas B. Fordham Institute, high school graduates improved when low-performing schools were shut down. Researchers analyzed the data surrounding the closure of both charter and traditional schools and found that students showed some improvements in academic performance after attending school in a new district. But others caution that transferring from a closed school has its own problems, including longer commutes and even physical dangers. Usually when we speak about college students and remedial coursework, we tend to think of low-income students. But according to an analysis of state and federal higher education data, 45% of students who place into remedial classes come from middle and high-income families. The need for remedial coursework is seen as a barrier to graduation. Mediocre high schools, it seems, affect all students. The kinds of careers young people pursue still seem to be gender-bound, and the White House is trying to change that. Senior advisor Valerie Jarrett notes that the fastest-growing jobs in America are the most gender-segregated. For example, jobs in STEM fields are in great demand, but women hold only 29% of them. Similarly, there is a great need for nurses, but only 9% of nurses are men. The White House is supporting efforts to have students think about their career choices in ways that go beyond gender stereotypes. That's it for this edition of EdCast. Till next time, class dismissed.